Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the College of DuPage. Uh, my name is Paul Servatka, the professor of meteorology here and the uh, current president of the Chicago AMS, although we need to get Chicago AMS doing more because somebody needs to step up and take over. Uh, so we'll be talking about that soon. Welcome to uh, everybody else. How many people here are from Valpo? We have a Valpo contingent up there. Uh, NIU, there's our NIU welcome here. That's a good. That's a good thing. How was uh, Span last Friday? You guys all did that. That was good. Yeah. This is. You, you guys have a good rock and roll and couple couple events. How many are from Wabanzi? Anybody? With the Wabanzi con contingent. They're, they are here usually. Uh, who else? Wisconsin. Do we have anybody? Wow. UW Madison. Woo! Nice. Nice. This is great. You picked a good day to travel. And you're not missing anything out uh, west. <laughs> I mean, there might be some storms later, but you'll see just a lot of dark things. Um, anyway, uh, anybody else from any other school around? College of DuPage. <laughs> you look really old for a COD student there, Arnold. Uh, for, for all of you here from my classes, how many of you are in my classes? Let's... Ooh. All right, so you get extra credit, but you have to turn in like a sheet of notes. And you can turn it in here or you can email it to me later. And it better be better than anybody from all these other schools. I'm going to be competing against you. Yeah, you have to tell. Okay, just so you know, my mind has been blown today by this man. I, I still am kind of recovering. Uh, I think uh, Cameron, Dr. Cameron Nixon, who is here from Ciro, is that how you say that, Ciro? The Cooperative Institute for Hazardous Weather and the, do you even know what that is? Cooperative Institute for Weather Research and Operations. No. You see? No, no, it's Severe Weather Research and Operations, and they got rid of the F. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Used to be from Sims. How many people remember Chicago AMS? Where are my Chicago AMS people here? Like all three of us, four, four. Um, SIMS, do you remember SIMS, the Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies or something like that? Storms, or I don't even know what that is. So they keep doing stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a, a branch of OU at the National Weather Center. Uh, Dr. Nixon works with uh, the Storm Prediction Center, does a lot of research. He's new with his PhD. You, you have that, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Whew. We're good. Because, <laughs> you know, nothing worse than calling him doctor when he's really yeah. a fake. <laughs> Um, no, today we were, we were going through some stuff and just some mind-blowing things, and I, I'm hoping that he'll kind of go off script a little bit, but uh, this is being recorded, so if you have, want to see this again in the future, uh, we'll send out a link on the Sh Chicago AMS and the COD AMS page, so you'll see where that is. That should be posted tomorrow. Uh, but it did blow my mind with just some new things. In the past, COD used to have a lot of conferences for severe weather, and we'd bring in a, a lot of big names. And at the time, tornado research was everything. This was kind of post-vortex world. And we would bring in Paul Markowski and Chuck Doswell and uh, Josh Werman and these people who we thought were like just really stars. And we've kind of saturated the, the tornado understanding. And now there's a lot of... There was kind of a, a lull for a while. I think Valpo, some of you guys used to have, do you still have your severe weather conference? Awesome, awesome. So a lot of those things are, and I've been kind of quiet lately. We just haven't done anything. And now I get somebody like Cameron Nixon who's bringing some fresh ideas into the science. Uh, and there's gonna be stuff that he's gonna be talking about in hail formation. Uh, I don't think you're talking too much about it, but lightning formation. These are all things that I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. I'm old. I'm ready to retire. So this is exciting for me because I don't know these things. And so he blew my mind with a couple of facts today that it's changing the, the way I think about things. And I think we're starting to see that struggle in the National Weather Service and with the Storm Prediction Center as we go from an old understanding of severe weather, uh, especially in terms of hail forecasting into kind of a new paradigm, trying to understand more about what kind of storms produce large hail uh, and how do storm interactions work. And I was able to work with Dr. Nixon uh, in developing some of our 
photograph forecast for the, for the wrap and just getting an idea of how to present this information. Photographs are, has everybody here studied photographs? Um, it's it's a great thing. 15, 20 years ago, hardly anybody knew much about them. And now we're learning a whole lot more, and I'm hoping that Dr. Nixon will teach you a ton more. So please welcome Dr. Cameron Nixon. Y'all, I, I just can't believe how many people are here. It, 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 like, I, I'm, I'm just beaming. And, and of course, we have Valpo representation. We have so many schools around here. It, it really just makes my day that y'all are here. So thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, and so I, I still don't even think COD really understands that all the stuff we're talking about right now, if this is a circle of everything that we've talked about today and yesterday, this is what we're talking about today. This is not even, not even remotely close. So I want to thank uh, a lot of people here. I've listed a couple of my Chase partners, too. I've listed like every Matt and, and Mateus that I know in my life. Uh, but, so th these are all, all people who are very instrumental in uh, not only like the publication process of this work, um, but also literally just driving me through uh, to storms and, and testing out this stuff in real time. Um, so what we want to get at is this age-old question, right? Why do some supercells produce X hazard while others don't? And so what we know is that the environment sets sort of a baseline probability of what hazards we could get, right? So more tornadoes occur with stronger low-level shear, stronger low-level cape, right? That's, that's, that's obvious. Um, more hailstorms, actually, we've been finding lately, occur with weaker low-level shear and weaker low-level cape. Um, so there's already kind of this, this yin-yang relationship between the environments of hail and tornadoes that we've been finding. Um, but the issue is that hail and tornadoes still occur in a super wide range of environments. And so that these are my, my kind of canonical um, southeast uh, US skew T and photograph versus our plains photograph and skew T there. And you know, especially if you're a chaser, you're probably used to that bottom sounding right there. Um, and what, what this almost suggests is that these, these environments, these, these environmental constraints are, are kind of optional. Um, for tornadoes, if you will. Um, or we just haven't figured out how they work. Um, so we haven't found this, this smoking gun parameter for tornado potential. And, and even our, our field research um, has shown very small differences between the, the environments of supercells that produce these hazards and those that don't. Um, and our, our light, similarly, our skill in predicting hail size is, is not great, and I'm here to tell you that. Um, so what are we missing here? What makes some supercells produce tornadoes and others not? So there's a lot of hypotheses. People love to you know, point at boundaries and say, oh, that's why the boundary did it or the terrain did it. Um, maybe there, there's just enough SRH. Um, who knows what, what hodograph this was? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> say it, say it. The Moore, Oklahoma from May 20th, 2013 at 2002. It is. Jesus Christ, <laughs> <laughs> This was an, this was an, <laughs> this was an EF5. Okay, EF5 tornado. Maybe you know the storm modified its own environment, right? That, that's that's kind of my one of my favorite cop out phrases that we talked about last night. Um, you know, mesoscale accident, right? Ashby wasn't a real thing. This didn't happen. Um, it was an accident. Um, and then my favorite, least favorite, you simulate a perfect environment and and 50 different storms in that environment. Half of them produce, half of them don't. So it's all just chaos. Nothing matters. We can't predict this at all. So I choose to be a little bit more optimistic. And for this study, I wanted to learn about storm interactions, how storms' interactions with external features might be kind of nudging probabilities one way or the other. Um, so I looked at tornadoes. I looked at EF3 and greater tornadoes. Um, and then in the plains, I looked at EF2 and greater tornadoes, because I assumed that they were you know, stronger than, than the DIs uh, would account for. Um, then I also looked at three inch and greater hail. Unfortunately, we have a huge plains bias with the hail. Um, but that's, that's to be expected here. So what we also did was look at null cases, cases that didn't produce these hazards, that were right next to supercells that did produce these hazards. Um, in this case, this was a tornadic supercell closely followed by a completely non-tornadic storm. So we had to look at that one. Um, so in total, we had a lot of storms, um, and then also a lot of null cases, which is kind of a unique thing in the study. Um, so, I did a lot of work, and I, I made my eyes bleed by looking at GR. 
Um, I, you know, I, I considered all these nearby cells, including cells that did not merge with the storm. And that's where the fun starts because these are not just cells that crash into the storm or merge in an obvious fashion. These are cells that kind of just hang out in its near storm environment. Um, and then so I recorded the positions, right? I, I want to know if they're in the forward flank or the rear flank um, relative to a storm's mesocyclone. <coughs> so the one thing that we need to hammer home here is that this entire study here was done by yours truly, OK? I did the work. I was the one insane enough to be looking at these, these radar stuff. And I, I don't wear that as a badge of honor because there's other ways to do this study. There's, there's, you could combine more people. You could do machine learning. Um, I am just one human being. Um, so my analysis throughout this project is going to be very consistent, but it's also going to be personally biased. Um, so that's something to consider. So which features were more common that I looked at? Well, cell interactions were by far and large the most common. This bar actually extended well off the graph, so I only uh, did uh, cases that only had cell interactions. Um, but also common were convective systems, supercell interactions, right, where you had two supercells right next to each other, maybe Fujiwara-ing or something cool like that. What was interestingly not as common in cases of significant tornadoes were boundaries. And very interestingly, almost all of these cases occurred in the plains. So these, these fine line boundary interactions seemed not really to be a big deal outside of the Great Plains, which is interesting. What was a big deal was boundaries for hailstorms. We see that almost half of our cases of SIG hail are produced by storms riding boundaries, which is completely opposite kind of what we usually think. We think of the boundary being the tornado issue. It's a hail problem, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but Really, the, the gist here is that storms very rarely produce hazards by themselves. And these, these cute little supercells that float through these entire warm sectors, they, don't, they aren't the ones producing our significant hazards. Yet we, we put so much focus on discrete supercells, discrete supercells, open warm sector. That's not what we're finding here. Um, so usually they get by with a little help from their buddies. <laughs> so why might these be important? So they can affect a lot of things. The propagation of storms, down boundaries. They can affect storm size, right? If you in inhale enough mergers, you get a bigger storm. Um, they affect storm inflow, right? Is this storm feeling unstable or stable rain-cooled air from the storms ahead of it? Um, or they might affect storm outflow. And we'll talk about most of these things today. Um, so storm size and strength, usually larger storms are more hazardous. I'm going to say generally, because there's a lot of exceptions, especially with mini supercells. Um, but it's important to remember that cell mergers can kind of have like an additive effect on updraft width and strength. Um, if you combine two updrafts, you're generally going to have a wider, stronger updraft. Um, makes intuitive sense. I and mean, we see this in the field, right? Uh, more mergers, uh, you, can, you can end up with these, these pretty um, uh, constructive mergers that create tornadoes and large hail. Um, you see that, that pink hail core um, start kicking in as soon as they merge too, which is really cool. Um, and then, of course, Hale really loves the, the mass problem, the bigger, taller storms. Um, and that, that's what leads to a lot of our big hailstones. Um, and of course, you can get wider tornadoes with more mergers. We've seen this in the El Reno case. We also saw this last year in Illinois, um, April 5th, uh, Table Rock, Bryant, et cetera. Um, you had a, a lot of mergers come together, create a really large storm, really broad mesocyclone. Um, so it's a problem. And this is, this is you know, common chaser knowledge, storm plus merger equals cash money um, if you're out there. You know this. And you know, I'll just do some more pretty loops. They're, they're, they're everywhere. You can see that. Pil the, the Pilger, uh, EF4 tornado outbreak, what if I told you it's just a conveyor belt of cell mergers, each spinning up a tornado as they, they merge into, into the, the beast that was already there? Um, really cool evolution. I'll play that again so you can watch this. Just a, a forever cycling um, conveyor belt, really. Um, so, okay, so that's all well and fine. We, we kind of all know this as chasers, that cell mergers are, are good for, for storms and tornadoes, et cetera. Um, but we need to remember that tornadoes are, and, and their potential are modified by the inflow that the storm is getting. Um, and usually, tornadoes benefit from having more unstable inflow. This is kind of a well-duh. Um, whereas hail, actually, we found benefit from a little bit weaker stability, um, maybe not that much buoyancy in the low levels. Um, so already a yin-yang relationship. But OK, you're, you're forecasting, you're chasing, or what have you, and you see this storm right here, and it's parked on a boundary. 
And you want to know, is this storm feeling stable or unstable inflow? Could this be a, a, a tornadic um, potential storm here? Um, so we need, in, we need some information. We need the uh, unstable side of the boundary, and we need to know where the cold air is, too, so you get this. Um, but now we need to know that inflow part. Is that storm getting that stable or that unstable air mass? So of course, look at a photograph and find your storm motion, and then find your inflow vector, which is going to be your storm relative wind from your storm motion to, say, the lowest kilometer, your atmosphere, right, your boundary layer. Um, so you draw that vector, um, and this you could juxtapose on top of you know, situations like this. I mean, you could see that your storm is getting inflow from the stable side of that boundary, right? Because that inflow air is bringing in that cold air from that side. This was actually a, a prolific hailstorm in OKC. Um, as convincing as it does look on radar, it did not uh, produce a significant tornado. Um, so now let's, let's switch things up. What about this storm? Is this feeling stable or unstable air? Unstable. Yeah, this was a tornado outbreak um, out in Nebraska, uh, June 20th, 2011. Um, so what shouldn't be surprising then is that when we looked at the storm's position relative to boundaries, almost all of our tornadic storms were on the unstable side of a boundary. Okay, again, duh. But look at our non-tornadic storms. And then look at our hail storms. These were on the stable side. So, and to put this back into perspective, 40% of our hail storms were on boundaries. And then you get 75% of those cases were on the stable side of the boundary. So there's something about hailstorms that like being elevated. So now let's, let's say we don't have a boundary. Let's say we have a, a discrete supercell floating through a strongly unstable and strongly sheared environment here. This is going to be an issue, right? So it, it's feeling unstable air. You're probably going to warn on it because you know th this is a, a classic outbreak scenario. Um, it produces a tornado, OK? So your, your warning already verified. Um, but now let's, let's cruise forward a little bit. And it actually drops this tornado rather quickly, um, starts looking kind of funky, produces you know, a lot of hail. What's, what's going on here? Why, why didn't this produce a, a long track SIG tour? It is indeed. OK, and as long as you know that inflow vector, you can tell where that air is coming from. So this was the beginning of the Henryville EF4 tornado. You had another supercell just pop up ahead of one that looked quite convincing, um, stole its inflow air, so to speak, and then started producing. Um, and so we know that this affects supercells, right? That this is uh, uh, even a supercell's own downdrafts um, can affect uh, the inflow air that a, a, a tornado ingests. And we actually talked about this earlier today, um, where we had these, these strongly curved photographs producing all this precipitation upwind of the tornado, stabilizing the inflow, and then really not working well for tornado potential there. Um, so the same thing obviously happens with, with external cells here. So, <laughs> when it, so when inflow is parallel to a line of supercells then, we have to play this game of heads or tails, where the head storm is the first to receive this unstable inflow, and then the tail storm down south gets kind of this regurgitated outflow air. And so this was, this was a funny case because a lot of chasers thought that that, that tail on Charlie would naturally produce a tornado. Um, this is the, the happy Texas day back in 21, I think. Yeah. Um, and so it didn't. You know, like your, your, your head end, whatever you call it, is, is producing. So then maybe you get a scenario like this where your inflow is, is also perpendicular to like a right-left pair, so your rightmost supercell produces all the, all the tornadoes and all the hail, and then our leftmost supercell kind of just lags there. Um, and, but the issue is when the inflow is line normal then, both of these supercells can produce because both of them have access to un unstable inflow. You're not working through the outflow in another storm. So unsurprisingly then, when we looked at pairs of supercells, the headmost or the rightmost supercell would almost always be the one that produced a significant tornado because it had, presumably, the, the cleanest access to that warm, unstable inflow. Um, and then we go to non-tornadic, and we see the exact opposite is true. Then we go to hailstorms. Look at, look at how many cases are on the tail end of another supercell. So there's something about hail being at the tail here. Tornado at the head, hail at the tail. And I, I, I like this, this moniker. I feel like it's easy to remember. But now we move over to convective systems, and it's, it's the same thing. 
tornado at the head, tail at the tail. And that, that we just find this over and over and over again. And the graphs, I'm not even going to show them because they look, look the exact same. And so, of course, when the inflow is normal to that line, that's when we're going to have issues. So the issue is we're all like raised to think that the tail on Charlie is, is a storm, right? Because the unstable inflow comes from the south. But that's not always the case. It's the storm relative inflow that matters. So this, it like, the, the tail on Charlie was, was found by previous studies to not have any statistical relationship to being the most frenetic storm or not. But we think that this, this ability for this tail on Charlie storm to produce depends on the storm relative inflow, where you have maybe a geometry like this, your inflow coming from the south. Yeah, your tail on Charlie would get that, that most pristine inflow error. But what about a case like this, right? Or what about a case like that, where your inflow is coming from the northeast, and it's that, that northernmost cell that's, that's the tail end Charlie in this case? So how do cell mergers affect a storm on a case-by-case on a -case basis then? Well, Chaser rule of thumb is that you got to wait for the merging to complete, right? you got to wait for this, this storm to kind of clean out. I mean, that's exactly what we found. We're going to show right here. <coughs> All these little dots here that might not be visible uh, from a lot of you uh, from that far away. I basically plotted the location of all the cells that I noted close to our storm here. And then what you can probably see, that red fill, is the density of these cells. Where, where were they most common at 30 minutes before tornado genesis? Um, so we can see here, 30 minutes before tornado genesis, we have a lot of cells nearby our supercells. Um, most commonly on the left side and the rear side. And we'll, we'll focus on these on the left side. Um, these are cells that actually dissipate prior to tornado genesis. You see the storm kind of cleans out. Its inflow air kind of cleans out. We have fewer cells closer and closer to tornado genesis. So this would lend credence to our, our, you know, our intuition that we got to wait for those mergers to kind of clear out and finish. Um, so forward flank mergers then can be disruptive. And like we actually see this too. We look at our, our non-tornadic versus our tornadic cases, and we see that the main difference here is cells on the forward flank. They're there. And they, they ostensibly seem to be stopping tornadoes. Um, so what about rear flank mergers? This is the fun part. <laughs> OK. So is, is, that, is that sitting well with you? Yes. OK. Because there, there's a lot, of, a lot of goodies here. So we know the tornado genesis usually requires a downdraft, okay? the rear flank downdraft. And we know, or at least we thought we knew, that the RFD is, is a supercell process, right? either by way of, of pressure perturbations and drawing down that, that st more stable air, um, or through some kind of obstacle flow. Um, air hits the supercell from above, it, it falls, et cetera. The issue is that Broyles came out a couple years ago and found that this can be assisted by cell mergers. And so, of course, it's another reason why storms plus cell mergers are usually a good thing. And you look at this, let, let this loop a few times and, and try to get a bearing on what's happening here. You have a supercell kind of floating slowly down I-44. This is your I-44 rider. Then you have a couple storms behind it crashing into it. And you can see how it ho its hook wraps up as soon as they, they make that impact on the storm. That, and hmm? more this was more 2015, or Brid Bridge Creek 2015, uh, finals week. And but we know, yeah. Don't ask me why I know that. Um, <laughs> the RFD can also be assisted by much larger systems, like this. Bam. And maybe even left movers. I'm going to let that loop again. Those little dashed red lines I have are the assumed position of the RFD, the left mover. As soon as it impacts that supercell, it spins up in the F4. Tap. So, but surely most supercells make their own RFDs, right? And these are all just, just freak accident <coughs> cases that I've, I've shown you. Well, maybe not. <laughs> this is what Burroughs found, that, that most tornadic supercells were accompanied by mergers. So he wasn't able to say that these mergers caused it, but he was able to say that they're there, suspiciously, at the time of the surge. 
And so I want you to look back at this image, and what looks like a totally discrete supercell make its own RFD might seem a little bit less so. So what we're seeing is that these nearby cells seem to be important, even if they don't merge. And I'm going to ruin El Reno for you forever. That, that 50 mile per hour eastward jog that that tornado took and that rapid intensification, there's no way that supercell did that by itself. You see those showers approaching from the left? As soon as they impinge on that supercell, you see that RFD kick out, accelerate the, the whole system, and then you have that, that crazy chaotic deviant, deviant motion. That motion was not predictable using the background environment. So I want to bring awareness to this, this new term, this new kind of breed of cells that we're seeing as nudgers, OK? Cells that don't merge, but still kind of tag along and nudge the RFD just enough for this process to ostensibly happen. And these could be discrete cells. These could be these, these bands of feeder cells, we call them. Or they could even be stratiform rain. You can see as soon as that, that amorphous complex approaches that kind of naked supercell up there, it immediately wraps up. And it becomes more of a, a larger complex. And these are everywhere, OK? I, I did the work for you. I <laughs> they're there. And here's where they were, right at the hook echo. And if we compare this to Chris's results, yeah. I actually didn't even know that Chris was doing the study. It was already published by the time I was halfway through this. So this is a perfect like double-blind experiment, both of us finding the same exact thing, which I think is pretty cool. And that's <laughs> research for you. And these were common even 30 minutes before tornado genesis. And of course, our, our current lead time is 15 minutes or less for tornadoes, because what we're focused on is the strength of the mesocyclone of the supercell and supercell-centric characteristics, right? The ZDR arc features of mesocyclone depth, et cetera. We're not, we're not concerned with the other features outside of that storm that might be causing these things to strengthen. So storms without these rear flank cells it were, in this study, very unlikely to be significantly tornadic. And this was the May um, 24th, 2011 Oklahoma tornado outbreak. This was the only supercell in that outbreak that did not produce a tornado. And what do you, what do you notice about it? <laughs> Just kind of chilling there. So, of course, we need to ask ourselves, OK, don't just blindly listen to everything I say. You need to question this. Are these cells actually necessary, or is this just a, a big, giant coincidence? Because I can show you all this. I can't tell you yes or no. That's the fun part. I'm just looking at radar, and I'm showing you what I see. But we know that tornado genesis requires a delicate balance between inflow and outflow. right? And this was found in, back in early 2000s vortex that the longest lived tornadoes had this kind of balance between their inflow and their RFD winds, which makes sense. And so we know if outflow is too strong, these circulations can be undercut. If inflow is too strong, you get excessive updraft tilting. And you also get this, this kind of syndrome where this, this vorticity fails to converge along the RFD. And you get these kind of icky dog-legged supercells that look like this. You'll see this in the southeast a lot. Um, and this, this is kind of a, a simulation of uh, vertical vorticity down a vorticity river. I mean, you see, we just we fail to wrap up. We fail to, to do that pretty supercell thing. Um, so let, let's draw this out to make this a little bit more relatable. We have a, a supercell here producing a forward flank downdraft. That forward flank downdraft can produce these, these little, you know, leaf nados, these, these pre-tornadic vortices. And, you know, they move relative to the storm relative inflow, right? The low-level storm relative winds invect these vortices, and they keep going. They don't, they don't sit in one spot. They don't converge. They don't spend that much time underneath the updraft. They need to to become much stronger. So how do these nudgers come in, then? Well, let's, let's put another downdraft right there, right? It's going to serve as basically a stop sign to halt the motion of these, these vortices, and then you can wrap up and produce a tornado. So if this were the case, these nudgers, then, should oppose the storm relative inflow in all of our cases, right? Like this, or like that, or like that. And that's, that's what we found. They're right there. See that storm relative inflow vector on the top? 
That's where our wind is coming from. That's where our inflow is coming from. And very coincidentally, they're opposing that inflow almost perfectly. So now, if that's true, then, how much of a, a nudge do we need? Well, that's going to depend on things. If, if the storm relative inflow is strong, they might need more of a nudge. And consequently, our southeast environments, they have these entire complexes following our, our supercells. You get these, these quasi-MCS hybrid kind of deals where it seems like in our really intense storm relative inflow environments, these become more common. And likewise, when our storm relative inflow is weak, we don't see these nudges as much. We get these mini supercells that very efficiently produce tornadoes, ostensibly on their own. Um, or they might need just a tap. This was, this was Chris Burrell's favorite case. Um, the Moore tornado 2013 sat on a boundary. Its effective storm relative inflow was really weak. And then this, this tiny little shower came along and spun up an EF5 in a matter of minutes. And that, that, that's what we found. When we subset our cases by weak and strong storm relative inflow, our weaker storm relative inflow had less nudgers, and our stronger storm relative inflow had more. And our stronger shear environments had, had more MCSs and convective systems associated with them than our weaker shear environments. And so, you know, what, what if an, a storm's outflow is already strong? Well, especially in high LCL environments, we see that these storms don't seem to need nudgers as much either. Um, so, and, and these nudgers might be really subtle. You see these couple cells that kind of form right behind the RFD here, and that's enough to kick out that RFD to the southeast. You see that rapid kick, um, and then that produces an EF2. Um, and that's all it took were these, these couple little blips on radar. Because your LCLs were so high, you're so dry, these produce very strong downdrafts that kind of kick-started the process. And that is what we found in excess. We found that LCLs were, were the biggest contributor to whether or not storms appeared to need these, these nudges or not. And some of the latest stuff I did was I kind of did a sanity check and I looked at SIN. Maybe, maybe lower LCLs are, are kind of serving as a proxy for less SIN, and that maybe the, these cells are just more common in lower LCLs because there's weaker SIN. I mean, that wasn't the case. <laughs> like, the, the, the distributions were equal across the SIN. Um, so it, it, it really seems like this, this distribution of more cells with lower LCLs is not a coincidence or at least I don't know um, what could be causing it to be one. So then you can play around with this balance a bit. Let's say we only have 50 knots of inflow, which is weak. And then let's say we have an army of cells behind our supercell. What do you think is going to happen in this case? Bam. <laughs> and what happens if you have Screaming 45 knot storm relative inflow, and then you only have you know a couple cells in the rear flank. Failure. And th there's been, there's been like entire like you know ten hatch style risk areas with these these little floater things that just just fail to wrap up. It, it's fascinating. Like they're they're in an ostensibly tornadic environment, right? Crazy shear, large low level instability but they don't seem to have the correct neighbors <laughs> to kickstart the process. So takeaways to this talk then, it seems that a storm's position relative to other features matters. Again, I can't tell you it does. I'm telling you that I found this. <laughs> and you can choose to believe this, or you can choose to find reasons why I'm wrong. And I would love to hear both of those. And we tend to get tornadoes at the head or the right and hail at the tail. And this is a repeated pattern. But this position also seems to matter with respect to the storm relative inflow, where these rear flank cells might enhance tornado genesis by enhancing the storm relative outflow relative to that inflow. And then our forward flank cells may actually disrupt tornado genesis, but enhance hail potential. And these stronger shear lower LCL environments usually always have more nudging before tornado genesis more trains, freight trains of convection following that supercell. Whereas our weaker shear, higher LCL environments, Dodge City anyone, don't seem to need this as much. And then you get these gorgeous tornadoes because they're not rain wrapped, because they don't need that rear flank downdraft. So 
I'll leave you with these talking points, and I'll gladly take any questions. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. That was a lot of talking. Anybody else need a nudge right here? <laughs> Questions? We have mics, and we have a couple of people who will pass them around. I heard you mention ZDR arc. Did, Did I say that today in the talk? Yeah. OK. Care to explain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that is a um, differential reflectivity basically tells you how, how oblate a raindrop is, if it's wide or if it's, it's, if it's kind of spherical. Um, and essentially, a ZDR arc is a ZDR signature that will kind of outline the streamwise vorticity current baroclinic zone region of a supercell, so kind of in the forward flank. Um, and it's because of the side sorting of drops. You get smaller drops to the left of that and larger drops to the right of that. Um, it, it's just a people, like NWS folks, use it as a proxy for um, kind of where the forward flank region is and if it could become tornadic. OK. Yeah, yeah. I don't consider that especially relevant to this, but that was a really good question. Yeah, yeah. Good question. So the different photographs that, that you would pull up um, to kind of give an idea for what the storm relative inflow winds were. Yes. Are you using, you're not using forecast soundings, you're using proximity soundings, are you using soundings generated from the VAD wind profile? Where yes. does that come from? For, for this study, we're using ERA-5 reanalysis. Okay. Yeah. So then, like, if, if you're out in the field and you're chasing, what's the best way to go about deriving a hodograph for a live situation when you didn't have a sounding since 7 o'clock in the morning? Hodograph maps and VWPs. <laughs> Well, well, the, and the VWPs are from radar, right. but yeah, yeah, okay. but yeah, that's that's really all that we have. A cars, if you've heard of those, I could show you. Dr. Nixon, thank you for taking my question. What do you think is the best environment? between a combination of boundaries and storm interactions that you would like to see for long-lived supercells that are cyclic and produce tornadoes for a long time? So the issue is you and I define cyclic as two different things. I define cyclic as shorter-lived tornadoes, but I think I get what you mean, like long-lived <laughs> tornadoes. Yes. Um, it, would, it would seem, based on this, I'm going to give a lot of spoilers here, but you know, you need strong low-level shear and low LCLs, it seems, because almost all long-track tornadoes have that environment in common. Um, and then, because you have that environmental setup, you would also heavily desire some kind of trailing convection, especially that stays behind the storm for a long period of time. I think I removed the Mayfield tornado case. <laughs> I was going to ask that. How does that... Yeah, that... um, so if you look up a radar loop for that, it was a discrete supercell with a feeder band behind it the entire time. <laughs> so assumably that inflow-outflow balance was maintained over the course of its life because it had that, that trailing convection. Thank you. Yeah, really good question. Hi. Uh, oh, hi. Um, thank you for the... I was going to ask about Mayfield in the... Yeah. Because it didn't have any like trailing uh, other than the cold front, as I remember. How about the rolling fork one? Yes, that also had a similar. So Mayfield. So look back at the radar loop for Mayfield. <laughs> You'll see what looks at first glance to be a completely discrete supercell, but look closer. It'll have that that flanking line convection that we saw in so many of our cases. It's like a, a little tail <laughs> of of storms. Um, uh, rolling Fork was the same way. 
it had basically just like a, a trail of cells behind it. Um, also, you can use the US Tornadoes um, case archive website. Um, they'll have the radar images of all that. And I'm actually going to put the storm relative inflow vectors on there too, so you can see how those relate to that. But it was, it was a very similar setup. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Appreciate it. Good question. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I have a question here um, myself. You're looking at all these cell interactions, and how much did you spend looking at maybe um, precipitation type? You know, big drops versus heavy rainfall, because so many times you start looking on radar and you're like, wow, this looks like a big, huge cell merger, and yet in the field you're you're seeing yeah. very little of anything. Because I, I don't know where that rainfall is actually falling or what kind of air is coming down. So that's a question. And then the second question is, in this stable and unstable air and the the inflow, how do you know what the actual temperature is doing other than the general area is rain cooled? Because there's always a, a spatial gap between where maybe some of the cooler air is and, and the, the types of gradients. I mean, do you have any corresponding concepts of uh, intersects that may have Temperature is so for for that second question. I have no idea. I, I I just found that these patterns existed and that presumably it was more stable than the surrounding air mass. Um, first question. Can you repeat that again? Uh, just the precipitation type, like yeah, yeah. Uh, whether you've got grapple or you've got large drops or something like that. What yeah. You know, how, how are you interpreting the radar? Do you do anything else besides just reflectivity when you're analyzing your storms? So I could have done, I, I could have did this by reflectivity. I could have did this by the motion of these cells relative to the supercell. I could have did this by their, their size. There's, there's so many other variables that I did not look at for this. And that is... Um, hopefully upcoming next if we do kind of a, a simulation study and we can make all these tweaks in a more um, a stabilized environment where like we could just look at one supercell and maybe we'll, we'll look at how a, a 40 dBZ shower affects it versus a 65 dBZ hailer, um, the size of the storm, how quickly it, it rains into the storm if it does at all. Um, all these are variables that we can kind of get under control in, in simulations. I had a question. First yeah. of all, do you remember taking your very first weather class? <laughs> Dumb question alert. I'm just, uh, just making sure you still remember it, okay? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. When, when Paul talked to me about uh, you know, hydrostatic, I'm a, I'm a science guy, right? So right away I thought he was talking about the circulatory system, so forgive me right away, all right? Uh, is there an example where a storm is, is, is forming in a tornado uh, genesis seems to be occurring, but then it fizzles out, but then it does happen, and it produces a very strong tornado. Is that nudging or lack of nudging, or is that something else totally? So you're saying tornado forms, but it, it's weak, it's it It's almost dive. forming, and then it fizzles, and then it... Yeah. 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 Um... Something tells me that you can't, well, I've, I've seen this happen on very Didn't small. that happen at, with the Alabama at the very beginning? So I'm trying to be like you all and look at these things, so please forgive me if I'm wrong, but I'm just asking. Yeah, no, and, and I've seen this pattern specifically in the southeast, and I think some of it could be a symptom of not enough nudging because your tornadoes are allowed to just leave the storm <laughs> if they want to, um, or occlude. They call it non-occluding psychogenesis, but like... Um, oh, I had another train of thought. There is another, did I, there is another part of your question that I didn't satisfy. What was that? Uh, I'm not sure. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah, essentially, like, I, maybe even the occluding tornado could serve as a nudge. Yeah. Yeah, that was the other part. You know, this is interesting because uh, some of the work that Eric Rasmussen did, too, in, in creating the tornado cyclone was just the, the correct placement on the updraft of a rear flank downdraft, mm -hmm. which is really not a rear flank downdraft. It's a, it's a cold, rainy downdraft of some other storm, so maybe in a multi-cell storm or maybe in a merger or some other cell interaction. 
So I would hypothesize that part of the idea is, and I, I've heard Eric talk about this, it's like, in order to get a tornado, you need a rear flank downdraft, or you at least need the placement of a downdraft, you need a downdraft in the rear in flank. The rear flank. <laughs> right, in the rear flank. Yep. What storms are most likely to produce a rear flank downdraft, and that's a supercell. So we call supercell tornadoes tornadoes that are come from supercells where you're creating the rear flank downdraft. But clearly it's not the case that they're producing their own downdraft, especially when you start looking at nudges and mergers. So it's, it's pretty interesting, but in terms of vorticity, like how, what papers maybe you could point us to that give us more theory uh, behind your observations? Um, so uh, Fisher and Dahl, uh, Yannick Fisher, Johannes Dahl. Um, Johannes has done even more stuff before this paper, but um, their, their whole theory on like how the nudging works and opposes the storm relative inflow um, it's a 2022 paper, uh, Fisher and Dahl, Supercell External Boundaries and, and Cell Interactions or something of that. Um, and they they go in depth as to, you know, and it's not even as simple as like just having winds oppose each other. There, there's density currents involved. There's like, there's all these subtleties um, that, that could be, you know, assisting in that process. But yeah, I, I would heavily recommend Johannes's work um, and then Yannick's. Sometimes we get strong to violent tornadoes in weak wind shear environments. We were talking about this in class earlier on, but for the benefit of everybody here, what do you look for in, in such an environment to make those happen? Yeah, so. <laughs> Gerald, Texas, for example. Right. So I'm going to, you guys are asking all the right questions, so I'm going to keep giving you spoilers. But like, what, what we're seeing is that like the storm, or what, I, what I'm seeing, is that the structure of these storms matters. And for all your long trackers, you have this, this really stretched out, think of the more uh, tornado, you have this perfect like long, stretched out, long necked appearance on radar. Like your, your forward flank downdraft is miles away from your tornado. And you need cases, basically that's, that's your outflow. That, that's your storm relative outflow, sending all that precip away um, from your tornado and keeping it well ventilated. So you need cases where you're especially near boundaries or other storm interactions that allow your storm to move very slowly relative to the upper level mean wind. Because if your storm moves slow, then your upper level outflow is, is magically stronger because it's moved away from that part of the hodograph. Um, so that's something that we've noticed, that these storms like more, um, they're parked on the boundary, they have really strong outflow, um, and they can sustain a tornado if it does form. Uh, hi, uh, I basically had a question about when you were talking about um, the um, when you separated between LCL height high versus low yes. and found that in the low LCL case you have a lot more of those nudger situations. Yeah. Do you think that's a product of the fact that low LCLs just tend to be accompanied by like more moisture in general in the environment or not really? Yeah, so like I, and, and that, that's the issue. That's why I looked at sin after the fact. Um, because I didn't want to believe that the, the signal with LCLs was that strong. Um, and it might not be. I, it might be, like my gut is that it is contaminated some, to some degree by some kind of convection initiation process. Um, I also think it matters more because like lower LCL environments produce weaker downdrafts. You generally need more of those, those cell mergers to create a stronger downdraft. Um, but I, I think that's really valid. I just, I can't point to I can't point to the exact thing that says, Cameron, you're wrong. You need to look at this like this way, um, especially when you try sin and it doesn't do anything. So like, I think you're onto something. I think there's something else there muddying the signal. Um, I don't know if it's enough to say that this isn't significant, though. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so was the Bassfield Soso case something that you studied for this particular uh, study, and if so, what was the deal with that? Yeah, yeah that was fun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, like in that case, you you did have like a, a heads or tails look to it, but the the um, storm relative inflow was not. It wasn't from like the due north. It was kind of oblique to both of those cells. Um, so I think that set the stage for at least both of those cells being able to produce. Now, I, God, I. 
a lot of these Southeast events are just piles of convection and downdrafts merging together in a favorable fashion. Um, I know, I, I remember the way the first storm formed out of this mush. <laughs> And I can't really tell you anything more than it's just, it was, you know, it was, it was a, a sustained cold pool that was able to have that, that nudging backing to, you know, converge enough for to and produce a tornado. The second one, I, I kind of forget how that formed, but really good question. I wish I could talk more about that one. Hey, Cameron, I uh, can't really off easy. <laughs> Great talk, <laughs> as always. Um, quick question for you. You mentioned mesoscale convective systems a couple times. Did you look at maybe like QLCS tornadoes and nudgers with those? I'm not talking about like a three ingredients method nudgers, but like uh, it seems like sometimes we see reflectivity tags merge in and you get like simultaneous mesovortex genesis. And one thing we really struggle with is when you get like three or four circulations that develop at the same time, picking out which one is going to be the one that does more than just like little tree damage. Yeah. Um, have you looked at that at all? Yeah. So personally, I, I don't have any statistics to back this up. Um, what, what I did find was that more QLCS tornadoes were associated with stronger shear, which would make sense. You'd need, if you have strong outflow, you'd need strong inflow to balance that. Um, brain losing track of thought. <laughs> so, um, but... The, the little reflectivity tags that you've seen, like I, I know what you're talking about. I've seen them. Um, they did not appear significant in the study. Um, what, what did appear significant was the, the, the outflow's direction with respect to the inflow. So the whole um, Przewinski, um, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, um, uh, zero to three kilometer shear vector line normal thing could be approximating some of this. Because, of course, the shear vector doesn't matter. It's a storm relative wind profile. I will have a couple more questions in a second here, but I do want to say something <clears throat> and ask something of the audience here. How is it that you know of Cameron's work? Where are you getting most of your information? You just scream it out or something. YouTube presentations, you've been watching that. How many are on like Twitter or X? <clears throat> Follow that kind of stuff. Where's your background coming from? There's a lot of really interesting questions. And what I found really interesting, and you're kind of a geek like this too, my friend, uh, this tornado and this tornado and this tornado and this tornado. And it seems to me that there is this high level of people aware of the science based on what's going on from social media. The conversations are taking place there. You're following this. You're looking at images. You're following GR level, you know, GR analysts, whatever. Uh, people from the Chicago AMS, I think this is, a, this is a difference that's happening, in my perception, yeah. from my generation to the new generation, is where this information is coming from and where it's being played out. Today's been super heavy emphasis on observational understandings just interpreting radar, seeing stuff on radar that I think 15 years ago, most people would never see. Uh, any NWS people, would you agree with that? Is there any, right? So it's almost like this new paradigm shift where a lot of information is coming up from sort of the ground swelling ranks of, yeah, let's look at this storm. Oh, we're talking about this storm. I was out chasing the storm, and here's what happened. And they start analyzing each storm in ways that a journal never would get to. Uh, and I think for those of us older in the science and trying to raise a new generation of scientists and researchers, I think this is really important to recognize how that paradigm has shifted. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if that something along the SPC struggles with that paradigm. You know, what's the more formal journal method versus the observational method? Uh, do you, can you say anything about if that's a conflict or what is your thought on that? I do know that a lot of SPC folks are on X and on like current events and, and watching because they're as, as geek as me. So like, I, I don't really know if, that, if that's like a problem or a, something that's 
you know. I'm just, I'm just wondering, do you ever get criticisms of lack of formal, um, I, don't, I don't know, like I, I want more than just a case studies or something? I mean... Well, I'm publishing this. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> but I'm saying, is, is there maybe some higher level of, I mean, I, I don't know, what's your thought? I'm, confu on, I'm confused by the question. Anybody else know what I'm talking about, Ron? Do you, do you think... That, do you think that when we, we take a look at the studies, just as I'm seeing this, right, I'm like, oh, how do we look at the formal definitions? You know, right. how do you the, the, it? the Ron Prisbolinskis of the world. Lots of formality and definitions of what this is. And here we're just uh, in the social media age where we're quick with terminology. Uh, some of the terminology is, is poorly defined. Yeah. And so... How would you define a nudger? I mean, one of the things that struck me in here is you talked about these little vortices that move in a strong inflow, storm relative inflow wind, and they, they move away and the, the vorticity never congeals. And you said, here's a little vortex, here's a little vortex, and sometimes they get together and they make a tornado. Yeah. And yet in the National Weather Service, those little vortices, which I would poo-poo as nothing, are being reported as EF0 or EF1 tornadoes. And next thing we know, we have an environment that's pretty crappy, and we're calling them tornado outbreaks because we have nine reports of, of tree branches down. And do you see, to me, that's like, what are you calling a tornado, and what is a subtornadic vortex, which maybe this is, or a spin-up, we all know that term, and I have a problem with, the la as a scientist, as a lack of formality of definitions, and I think we're, we're getting into the weeds a lot, and it kind of scares me. And I certainly, Ron, I, you've talked, I would really like to encourage you if you'd say something or give your comments on that. I, I personally think that, like, I, I've just heard so many definitions and acronyms that, like, our, our community is just filled with them, and I'm just like, I may as well just make some more. <laughs> it's funny, Ron Prisbolinski, I, I once talked to this, because we talked about QLCS tornadoes, and in the old days, it was a line echo wave pattern. And I'm listening to this information, and I go up to Ron after one of his talks, Ron Prisbolinski, and I said, Ron, what's the difference between a QLCS and a line echo wave pattern? Uh, you, sounds like you're describing the same thing, and he sits there and he's like, oh, I guess they're the same thing. And then I realized that the QLCS was a Morris Weissman makeup when he was just making up a term, and he wasn't that familiar with the term line echo wave pattern. And yet, this divergent understanding of what these things are, yeah. and it's just, it's like they switch, and as a teacher, I'm going, be be precise. Tell me what you mean by that. Right. Yeah. I, so we're really glad you mentioned that because basically I'll just say yes. <laughs> it's really difficult because there, there's multiple things that are going on. For one, um, the way that the warning statistics are set up right now is you're rewarded for catching every little, for lack of a better term, bird <laughs> fart tornado. Um, and public perception, uh, at least what social science is telling us, is that a missed event is treated more harshly than a false alarm. So you're basically rewarding issuing tornado warnings on anything that has the potential to spin. Now, I think the future is bright in the sense that we're starting to move away from warning on what's causing the damage and more toward the degree of damage. So we talk about this in our office all the time, in the Chicago National Weather Service office. Um, when are situations where we will make the conscious decision to not issue a tornado warning when we know there's a tornado? And was it two weeks ago, Kankakee County? Um, there are some really low top spinners. We knew with almost 100% certainty, yeah, there's probably tornadoes happening, but we're not going to issue a tornado warning because they're not going to do anything besides knock down some tree branches or last more than a minute. So there's some offices like ours where we're trying to combat that a little bit without necessarily rocking the boat too much because we want to focus on those tornadoes that really have a threat to lives and property, right? The Neighborville EF3, um, the one that hit the theater in Belvedere last year on March 31st. Um, but one of the challenges is, and this is why I partially posed the question to Cameron, is when you have a QLCS storm mode, a relatively uniform environment, you have three circulations that develop at the same time. One of them produces damage that destroys a house. The other two only produce tree damage. Um, and they look the same on radar. And being able to determine which one is going to do the, the worst damage is really difficult. Um, and trust me when I say if, if we have an event that's unwarned that does a lot of damage, it really 
keeps us up at night. So there's a lot of factors that kind of go into it. But um, to summarize, we're hoping in the future we can warn more on like damage potential versus what's causing the damage. Is it spinning 360? Is it spinning 30 degrees? I don't really care. A tree is down, a house is destroyed, right? That's really what I want to focus on. So what are what is happening to actually put that impact-based warnings in there and doing away with tornado versus non-tornado? Because, yeah. at, you know, I, I, I ask some of my students, 1974, super outbreak, or 2011, what had more tornadoes? When you look at the damage of the 74 outbreak, what, 80% of them were EF2 or higher tornadoes and six EF5s? The number most likely would have been 100 to 200 tornadoes more if we counted tornadoes the way we do now with branches down and little spin-ups and EF zeros and blah, blah, blah. So it's almost as though severe thunderstorms don't know how to produce damage anymore unless they're c considered tornadoes. Yeah. And I have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to a certain degree, I, I think, you know, maybe nowadays we have a better estimation of how many brief week spin-ups are occurring. I think back in the day, call it 10, even 15, 20 years ago, I think these things were happening. We just didn't know because someone didn't send the picture. We didn't have the radar debris signature, the more aggressive radar scanning strategy. So that's one part of it. Um, but another part of it, you asked, you know, what is being done? Uh, Rich Thompson, uh, it's SBC forecaster, recently put out a paper looking at right-moving uh, supercell tornadoes versus QLCS tornadoes. Makes a pretty convincing argument that not all QLCS tornadoes need tornado warnings. Uh, we're spinning up a project, pun intended, at our office right now. <laughs> that wasn't intentional. Um, act, that's actually looking at not to get uh, put the, the cart before the horse, but if you look at tornado damage survey data and looking at like EF0 versus EF1 and EF2 points, what warnings were in effect? Um, what percentage of EF2 points had a tornado warning effect? What percent of EF0 points only had a severe thunderstorm warning in effect? And using that as sort of the groundwork um, to inform a future warning strategy. And of course, our warning strategy has, has limitations as it is right now. I mean, there are polygons that are static. The only thing we can do once it's issued is trim it. We can't move it forward in time. Um, NSSL, is, is it still NSSL? I can't keep track of the acronyms. Okay, yeah, I know they're working on um, you know, different paradigms. Uh, looking Things at like motion. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's like Tiny Tim and, and all the threats of motion. Um, threats of motion. You no, know, you know the government, things move very slowly, but I think the future is, is bright. I'll say that again, we're um, eventually we will get better. Um, warning for the impact versus what's actually causing it, updating the way we issue warnings, updating really the the shape and dyna or dynamic nature of the warning. Um, but a big part of this also comes down to the science and the work that Cameron's doing um, to help us identify situations, maybe a nudger in the right quadrant of the storm that'll give you a strong tornado versus just a little brief weak tornado. Um, this is stuff that's not necessarily taught in the classroom and certainly not taught the Weather Service employees very often. So um, Cameron, you need to keep this up. <laughs> keep talking to uh, classrooms you. like this and Weather Service offices like you're doing in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and hopefully we can work towards something that's a little bit better. Because I, I agree off the record, we should not be issuing tornado warnings for these little EF zeros that aren't doing anything. Okay. And then the problem is if you did issue a warning, then there's incentive to go find the damage, which is scary too. <laughs> yes and no. Um, we usually know if there was a tornado. Um, I, there may be some offices, yes, where they issue a warning, they're more likely to look for damage versus not. Um, that's not something necessarily that we, we adhere to. Um, if there's a tornado, there's a tornado, whether a warning was in effect or not. Um, but again, we look more so at what was damaged versus whether it was a tornado or damaging winds. Are any of the tornado warnings tagged like the severe thunderstorm warnings are? D you know, yeah, I mean, we do have tags, like, um, like you probably heard like considerable catastrophic tags. Um, it would be neat to have a tag where it's just like like brief, weak QLCS tornado. Um, but there are tags. But at the same time, we don't want to minimize just a base tier tornado warning. A tornado warning, in my opinion, is still an emergency situation. We don't want people to wait for the emergency to go out. Um, I kind of wish tornado emergencies were never invented <laughs> uh, because people wait for that before they really make a big deal out of it. So um, I think it all comes down to identifying those situations where you're going to have potential for EF1 or EF2 plus damage and slap a tornado warning on it before it happens. That's the goal, really. And we don't necessarily lose sleep over a brief EF0 that knocked down a few trees. Okay. Yeah. Uh, other comments about this conversation? So one of the things as an AMS meeting, I like to have this ability is Cameron throws <clears throat> ideas into your head and you I like to process them out loud. So any other comments from people? Please pass it around. 
I I love Trey Greenwood. <laughs> yeah. His oh yeah. YouTube series on like um, going over all this stuff is really interesting. I think he does a really good job. We may or may not be uh, teaming up to do something on this too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just to comment on uh, your last question, I think you would be a lot more disappointed in the near future because there's a lot more weather that's going to be um, asked through um, NASA and FIA uh, just from um, the regular um, person just to submit data uh, locally. Um, so getting back to the um, study here, I'd write it down because there was so much other stuff going on. Um, for your study here, did you look for nudgers in the study? And part B is you mentioned further studies with these variables with this data. Are your simulations computer-generated algorithms or wind actual wind tunnels? Yeah, so the... Um the nudger, the whole nudger concept, concept was found after doing the study. During doing the study, um, my goal for the study was only to figure out like, what did these cell interactions look like preceding tornadoes, and so that's where they kind of popped out. Um, the second one, yeah, this is going to be something that um, me and a couple <laughs> other people from the SPC and, and Ciro team um, might try to do is, is simulate these on computer models and kind of do a controlled setting where we have like a supercell here and then a cell here, but maybe we change the cell's intensity or its speed or it's a lot of different things. So wouldn't that be biased because it's already known data that you're feeding it in? Um, I, I guess, no. It, like, it, it's, it's unknown what the result of that interaction would be. But we would, yeah, we, we would have a controlled setting where like the supercell itself doesn't really change between runs. Um, so we could see how many different outcomes we have based on how strong that nudger is. Hi, uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, you just said uh, that you were originally just looking for cell interactions. Were there any other cell interactions that you found in your study that you weren't able to look into as in depth, but you still found interesting formations, I guess, if that makes sense? Really them? good question. Yeah, because th there is one that I never talk about in this talk that is kind of interesting. Um, I don't really have a loop right now, but Basically, um, I call it a, a handoff, or like the supercell um, propagates up shear. So it, it's different from that. But like you'll have a you'll have a supercell up here, and then another one will form out its tail and then become dominant. And that's actually something that I noticed with a lot of hailstorms and tornadic storms. Is like the super. It's like it's not like mitosis, but like it just kind of does woo, like <laughs> new storm, and then all of a sudden it just does that. So yeah, um, if you what's a good example? Um, I'm gonna be put on the spot, but yeah, just, just, just keep an eye out. Keep an eye out. You'll see these these the supercell do this weird little thing. <laughs> um, my question stems from: with a changing climate, are we more likely to see nudgers or mergers? Do you think? <laughs> good question. Yeah, I mean, as, assuming we understand that more nudgers are possible in higher L or lower LCL environment, I don't know. Th this, this is really speculating. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really know how to answer that, really, honestly. No worries. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I had um, two small questions. My first one was you were looking, you said you were looking at storm mode when you started kind of doing this research. What initially led you to even starting this research? Like, was there something that catalyst you into doing the research or? Yeah, good question. I, it was, so my PhD was on hail. And I found during that study that the environment, the hodograph, the skew T, it works for hail prediction, but it it's not that great, <laughs> and it and it especially doesn't work if you're talking like beyond like three inch hailstones. Like there, you, there's hardly any signal. So 
I, I just wanted to figure out, like, is, is there something we're missing that's not in the environment? And for some reason, storm interactions were the avenue for that. I just wanted to see what other storms were like nearby. And my, I first came into it thinking that, like, it would be a mergers thing. Like, hail would, more hail would be likely with more cell mergers. And very interestingly, that's not at all what we found. And then my second part was you did mention, you mentioned a lot about hail, and I know one of the other hazards we do kind of get with uh, supercells is a tornado, not tornado, the lightning and how much lightning we get with certain cells. Is that something that you kind of looked at and then just decided I'm not really going to look much at it? Or is that something that might be looked at more in the future with this type of storm systems? You're asking a really good question because I just had this conversation with somebody here last night. But I, I seem to think that lightning production is quite heavily tied to hail production. Um, something in the, the microphysics and, and how much ice versus liquid water we're dealing with and how much, how much collisions been with between ice particles and whatnot. Um, and so, no, I did not look at that myself. I think there is a big connection between hail and lightning and elevated storms that we have yet to look at. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, for storm interactions and specifically mergers and, and nudgers, is this, is this new stuff? Like has this, is this something that's been known for a long time or are, you know, I'm basically asking like what, why now? Is it because there's more data now than yeah. 10, 15 years ago or? Good question. So the mergers, have always been something that have fascinated people. And there have been studies on cell mergers associated with tornadoes dating like a couple decades. Um, so that part's not new. Um, the part that is new, I believe, is the understanding that cells that might not even merge might have a completely different um, effect on the storm. And I guess it's just not something people have looked at hard enough. Um, I know, I, I think we've had radar data for long enough to draw those conclusions. Um, we haven't had like, you know, our, our super res, high res, um, and our, our TDWRs for very long. Um, so that might be, I, I think sample size is, is a big issue. I mean, you saw this, this study was almost 500 cases, but if you break it up, like tornadoes were like 250 or so, and that's not a whole lot. And like a decade ago, it, it would have been really hard to amass that many cases. So I think the, the whole having more data is a big part of this too. Really good question. One more, Gilbert. <laughs> Based on what you found, the interesting things that you found so far, where do you go from here? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think a lot of the, like, and I, I'm personally an observations person, like, I believe this stuff a lot more than I do models. Um, you know, is, is that the right or wrong thing to do? I'm not sure. Um, but I think a modeling study would be very important for this. And I, I think the, like, what we plan to do with the simulations will be kind of an important, for those people who do really appreciate models, it will be an important, like, second opinion. Um, to stuff we see here, like is it, is it relevant? Does it become more relevant with stronger storm relative inflow, lower LCLs, whatever? Um, or are we just seeing this? Is this just something that falls out? I, I believe there's a lot here to communicate to forecasters that is applicably useful even now, um, but I would rather those nuances be kind of entertained with models first before I go off saying a lot of this stuff, yeah. Yeah, good question. Well, thank you, Dr. Nixon, once again. Yeah. I just want to point out we will have one more AMS meeting this spring on May 15th, one month from today. It'll be a Wednesday night. Uh, Dave King from the National Weather Service here in Chicago will be talking about fire weather, something we have not addressed in uh, Chicago AMS for some time. So we'll be talking about some local fire weather and maybe more broad 
fire weather hazards across the country. So all are welcome, May 15th. Thank you all for coming. Have a safe drive home. 7 p.m.